What's up my Ascension Gunnats, it's the Sunshine Kirso, back again with another classic SummerSlam pay-per-view review. So we're going back to the year of 1997, see how Brent, Sean, The Undertaker, Bulldog, and The Legion of Doom, see how they get along of this SummerSlam, the anniversary SummerSlam I'm going to talk about right now, that is SummerSlam 1997 at the Continental Airlines Arena, I think right now it's called the Meadowlands, in East Rutherford, New Jersey, on the 3rd of August, 1997. The attendance of the show was 20,213. Uh, SummerSlam 1997 received about 235,000 pay-per-view buys, an upgrade. Then the 1996 SummerSlam show, uh, the main event of that show was Shawn Michaels uh, defending and retaining his World Wrestling Federation Championship against Vader. Um, and also, at that same show, you had Mankind um, and The Undertaker compete in, I think it was the first Baller Room Brawl. And that was also a good match, uh, the Taker Mankind match. Um, by the way, uh, SummerSlam 96 received about, I think it was about 157,000 people buys. By the way, I reviewed uh, SummerSlam 96 uh, last year on this channel. Go and check it out. Um, the commentators the show are Vince McMahon, Jim Ross and Jerry the King Lawler. This is the company's first televised event in the state of New Jersey for eight years um, since uh, SummerSlam of 1989, another show, another SummerSlam I review in the past. That was known for the whole, you know, the main event, the new, the, this no holds barred rematch, you can call it. Um, the Mega Maniacs, uh, Hogan and Beefcake taking on Savage and Zeus. Um, the reason why they never like did, I feel they probably do house shows in in the state of New Jersey, but not like a, a televised event in the state of New, in the state of New Jersey. Um, they put like like so they banned the company to do a televised event in the state of New Jersey. They kind of put like a, a tax like some heist, you know. They put like you know if they perform a show in the state of New Jersey, um, they end up like getting fucked over. Uh, financially, you know, but the end, yeah, it was a tax ban or some shit. I can't, I don't really know. So, um, you had on this show, you had the governor of New, of the state of New Jersey, I think, uh, Christy Whitman, kind of raised the tax. So, yeah, it's the first company's first um pay per view in the state of New Jersey for eight years. Wow. So, anyway, so um, before we get to the um, and also yeah, he came out. Uh, she came out. You know, you had Gorilla Monsoon giving her the um a replica of the WWF uh, championship belt. You know, I like it was one with a wing eagle. That is a cool belt, uh, by the way. So, yeah, you know, there's one segment um uh, yeah on the show. This is the million dollar contest they did. I forgot to mention this on my raw reviews. The reason why I review I don't mention it because it did already do nothing for me. It's again, I I get. The company credits, you know, they're doing like some kind of game show. You know, they had the chance for the audience on TV, on the phones or on TV, you know, around America to win a million dollars. You know, um, you had two guys, um, you got a kid and a man, one uh, are the finalists. You got Ryan, Ryan Cheddick and um, Patrick Stevenson. Um, you know, you had uh, Todd Pettengo in his final pay per view appearance until he made his cameo appearance. His, in the NXT TakeOver In Your House pay-per-views in 2020 and 2021. I reviewed one of those shows two years ago. Go and check it out. I think it was the um, 2020 NXT um, TakeOver In Your House show. That was really good. I really enjoyed the um, the women's triple threat match. I really enjoyed um, Keith Lee versus um, Johnny Gargano. That was a, a good match. Um, anyway, so... Anyway, so you had Sable and Sonny coming out. Very... Beautiful, attractive women for the for the company because on the WCW side, you know, the WWF you had the the blonde bombshells in in the WCW side you had the brunette bombshells of Kimberly and um, Miss Elizabeth. You know, they both got brown eyes and brown hair. Yeah, Medusa's oh also a blonde. You know, but um, but on the WWF side you've got like the beautiful bl uh, bombshells of Sable and Sunny. Anyway, so they came out wearing like cool, um, really outfits, you know, like 
really, there are really Sable's fucking hot, man. One of the hottest women in professional wrestling history, uh, at the time. So anyway, so the game show was a a clusterfuck. You know, like they're trying to call, you know, call someone on TV. They end up like not answering or disconnected. It's like very cringe worthy and like awkward. You know, Todd Pettingill, Todd Pettingill tried, you know, um, you know, they tr like, they're trying to like, like guess the number to, you know, for the key of the coffin to get the, or the casket to get the, um, the money. Um, they're trying to open the casket, they didn't like, no luck. Um, the, uh, kid who's 12 and Steverson looks like, you know, he's like with the bald head, did not really, uh, want it. it it's a shame, you know, I hate, uh, game shows, like. You reach the final challenge, but not leaving the building with money. It's just disappointed, you know. But, um, yeah, it didn't really accomplish anything, you know. They just, like, came for nothing. Yeah, they enjoyed the show, but the game show part was disappointed. Um, yeah, they tried their event, um, tried their attempt a decade later with the Million Dollar Mania. That was also a clusterfuck. Yeah, I'm glad they never go back to doing this type of stuff ever again. So, anyway, so that's... It. So moving on to the mat the matches of the show. So the first match to kick off SummerSlam 1997. This is a still cage match. Uh, Hunter Harris Helmsley. That's um, the future Triple H, by the way. Uh, with China in his corner, taking on Mankind. Um, um, th this is technically the fourth match of the rivalry because the rivalry started at the 10th of May episode of Shotgun Saturday Night. You know, you had uh, the match ended disqualification. At the time, Mankind and Houndsley are healed. Uh, China low blow Mankind. That led to, I think it was a DQ. Then they compete at the 1997 King of the Ring tournament. They reached the finals. Um, Houndsley won the 1997 King of the Ring tournament. Um, it was a good match, but like I said, it was too, ma too many interference by China. Really brought it down. Um, and then they had the rematch, um, you know, at Canadian Stampede. I think the match ended a double count and a fight outside the arena. So this is the, you can take a look, the fourth match of the rivalry between Helmsley and Mankind. And this time, this is a still cage match. And good match, but same problem. China interfered, you know. I'm not, I'm not it's a shame. I, ha I hate to speak ill of the dead about her. You know, she recently passed away. You know, in 2016, but she interfered a lot. You know, you know, it just made Triple H like a doofus. I hate to quote CM Punk. You know, he called him the the doofus son-in-law. Son-in-law. My apologies. I speak I speak too fast. You know, the doofus son-in-law. But he's kind of like a doofus. You know, you just can't like. It just like rely on your lackeys to do the job instead of you doing the job by him, by yourself. It's just like weak. But anyway, so he she did. Got involved, like, in one more of the match, you know, Mankind locked in the memorable claw onto Helmsley. Uh, China, I think he choked, um, I think he choked, uh, Mankind. You know, pulled him by the he by his hair. Um, yeah, um, uh, yeah, and then minutes later, Mankind trying to skip the cage. China low blow him. He's back in the cage. Um, and then, you know, I think, yeah, she... And also, she kind of pushed the referee, um, slammed the cage door in the face of Mankind. But um, besides that, really good. It's really compelling match. The, you know, did like a suplex off the off the top row. Really enjoy the chemistry between, you know, Paul DeFeck and uh, Ma uh, Mick Foley. Um, sorry I used their real names. But uh, re really good chemistry, you know, back and forth. Uh, one more of the match, I think he had uh, China throw the, um, the blue, ca uh, blue chair. By the way, there was, it was a blue cage. It's, I think it's one of these final matches with those cages before you seen before they had the cages still cage you see right now. Back then they used these blue and black cartoonish cage. Um, going back to like 1986, you know the match between Hogan and uh, and King Kong Bundy at uh, WrestleMania two. Anyway, so um, anyway, so China threw the blue chair. Uh, Helmsley trying to go over the pedigree. Uh, pedigree, pedigree Mankind onto the blue chair. Mankind countered it. Catapult uh, Helmsley and Helmsley knocked China off the, the cage. Um, and then Mankind, um, you know, uh, about to, um, he's about to escape, the, uh, get out of the cage. 
but he ended up like doing that the dive and, and he t removed his uh, mankind mask and ripped his um he was wearing like a brown suit in his early run as mankind before he ended up like wearing the the shirt and tie going into the attitude era um he removed it to see like a it was supposed to be a pink heart around his chest because Recently, he debuted as Mankind, you know, doing the whole, they're trying to like, get in this, you know, trying to make this free face, trying to pull, like, like, pull this massive trigger on this free face of Foley storyline, you know, they had this whole interview segment with Jim Ross to get more information of all about what, who is uh, Mick Foley, Mankind, Catless Jack, Do Love Is, um, and Do Love deb debuted, helped um, Stone Cold Steve Austin retaining the tag team titles against um, Owen and Bulldog. In that role in San Antonio, Texas. So, and yeah, the the heart was washed out because they wrestled in it. I think it was like twenty five minutes. Uh, I'm not too sure. It was like just, I think the better of like mankind wearing like a piece of the sh the dude love shirt. Um. Anyway, so he did the diving elbow off the cage, paying homage to Jimmy Snucker because you know the story that uh, Jimmy uh, Mick Foley went to see Jimmy Snucker in M MSG. Um, you know, he hitchhiked to go to MSG to watch the wrestling match. Um, I think it was uh, Jimmy Snucker versus Don Morocco. Um, uh, anyway, so, good pay homage. So, anyway, so, uh, Mankind trying to climb the cage door. China getting into the cage, trying to help Helmsley to escape the cage via the cage door. Mankind beat, um, Helmsley, you know, before, the, the, he kind of escaped the cage before Helmsley and China... Uh, you know, skate, uh, went through, went out the cage door. So mankind won this match, equalized the um the rivalry because man uh, Helmsley won technically the second match at King of the Ring. Uh, the other one was a, a no DQ or uh, actually a DQ. Actually, it was a count. Up. My apologies at Canadian Stampede. Yeah, this was the beginning. This was the uh, bit of a hiatus of the mankind character for now. He ended up becoming mankind. In his uh, feud with Kane, leading up to their match at Survivor Series that year, he ended up doing it. He ended up like doing the toll tap, and hearing and playing Doodlum's music. You know, yeah, Doodlum was a good character. You know, like his debut. You know, showing the white boots. You know, with with the upbeat music. You know, during Austin's match with Bulldog and Owen. But um, anyway, so the rivalry still continued. They had the match at One Night Only. And then, then they had that match at Madison Square Garden on an episode of Raw. I think it was before Bad Blood, I'm not too sure. You had, uh, or maybe after Bad Blood, I'm not too sure. You had um, the debut of Catless Jack in the, in the Day Day Ave in a false count anywhere match. So, yeah, they're trying to push through, trying to get like fully over with this free, uh, free phase of fully storyline. You know, he's becoming this three-dimensional character because, yeah, I said, like, uh, the Mankind character when he debuted in 1996 was um, getting stale. But, um, yeah, they made it, it was one-dimensional at the same time. But this time he's now three-dimensional, you know, doing Dude Love and then Catfish Jack. So, anyway, but on the flip, on the, uh, by the way, this match was really good. Really is a good way to kick off the pay-per-view. And also, uh, Mankind is 2, I think it was 2-0, and oh. yeah, 2-0, and oh, because he defeated The Undertaker in the Bully Room Brawl at the previous SummerSlam. And then, I think the next two, he ended up losing, because he ended up losing the Triple Threat match. He ended up losing a, a tag team match, or a handicap match to The Outlaws at SummerSlam 98. And, um, I think it was a Triple Threat match against Helmsley, or Triple H, and Austin in the Triple Threat match for the WWF Championship. At SummerSlam 99 in the main event. Helmsley, I think it was a good match. I think the one match really, like, so far, Triple H so far did, didn't really have a breakout performance, a breakout match, you know, um, set him for life. Um, for, I think, forget the whole hug pen match at, in, in, in your house, December of 1995. Um, I think the one match really, like, he had a breakout performance was against The Rock. At the following year's SummerSlam in 1998, in the ladder match for the Intercontinental Championship. So that's my opinion on it. So, but anyway, so like yeah, it was a, a long to talk about the opener. The next three matches or four matches, I'm gonna keep it short and simple. 
So yeah, um, the next match, uh, we got Goldust with Marlena in his corner, taking on the loose cannon Brian Pillman, representing the Heart Foundation. So, um, this is personal because if, I didn't, I never knew this. I never knew this, um, because Pillman and Marlena, um, they had history between each other because they they were a couple. You know, they were dating in, in days where they were in, w, they were in WCW before Marlena, Terry Reynolds ended up like dating and marrying Dustin Rhodes, Goldust, having that kid Dakota. So if uh, Pillman uh, lose, lose this match, he ended up wearing a dress. You know, he had this um, pre-match promo before this match, said to Marlena, you're waiting... <laughs> You're waiting for me for wearing your dress. It's not gonna happen. You gotta whine and die me first with that smile, that mannerisms, that facial expression of Brian Pillman. Wow, that dude's very underrated, man. You know, it's just like that dude fits the attitude era pretty damn well, Brian Pillman. It's a shame that the guy, the guy was dead in October 1997. That dude could be on, on, on his way to become like on the same level as Stone Cold Steve Austin, being one of the biggest stars. Of the attitude era, the big two for me is Stone Cold and The Rock. You know, Pillman could be the big three, you know, if he stayed alive. So, anyway, the match was okay. The one problem, the two things about Pillman, you know, he's like okay, some of his matches on Raw was a bit short. This was a little longer, but here's the two things. But number one, he you always know, a heel. He can't do flashy stuff like high flying moves because he end up getting cheered. He wants to get like his heels to possibly get in the heat. They possibly cheating. And two, Pillman was never the same after the car, was it a vehicle accident? He ended up like fracturing his ankle. That really finished his career off. It was never the same. I, I like his matches in WCW as flying Brian Pillman, you know, because he's really fa fast paced, really good. Um, Like I said, Brian Pillman is a very underrated worker in ring wise and character wise. That's my opinion. So, anyway. Short and keep it match short and simple. Yeah, you had warm up of the match. You had Pillman going after Marlena. Um, there was a mannequin in the um in the uh, ringside. So, um, yeah, it was really okay. Um, you had uh, you had like Pillman's face was covered in Goldust's face paints. You know, warm up of the match. You had Goldust kissing Pillman. You know, he, you know he was doing the whole bisexual gimmick. You know, you know he, he ditched the the homosexual gimmick. You know, he ended up like doing the stuff with uh, Marlena. Anyway, so keep it short and simple. The match was a, uh, the, the the ending was a bit awkward and a clusterfuck, you know. Uh, Goldust botched a sunflip power bomb, or he was going for like sunflip roll up, but he botched it, and then, and then in the end, Marlena hit Brian Pillman in the face with the, with the pat with the you know with the nut with the hand purse. Yeah, I call it the, yeah with a loaded purse. In the end, Goldust got the victory, and Pillman must wear Marlena's dress. And afterwards, Pillman ended up destroying the mannequin. So I'll get to that Raw after SummerSlam next time. So it was an okay match. Could be a lot better. Felt like a match you probably see on Monday Night Raw. Um, this was Pillman's second to last pay-per-view match before his death. His last one was at Grand Zero the following month. Um... So moving on to the next match. So the next match, this is a tag team match. We got the Legion of Doom, that is Hawk and Animal. They've taken on the Godwins, that is Henry and Phileas. Phileas is the featured medium, by the way. Um, the the build going into this, they had a match on a few free, a few months ago at Shotgun Saturday Night. They had a tag team match. Um, Henry ended up injuring his neck. In a botched Doomsday Device by the Road Warriors. I don't understand why they didn't call them the Road Warriors. You know, you know, Legion of Doom. That's just you know, the, the people to prefer them to. Legion of Doom is the a super villain group from the DC comics. So anyway, I'm gonna call them the Road Warriors. By the way, so yeah, Villia, uh, Henry got hurt with that um do that botched Doomsday Device. Doom Doomsday Device attempt by the Road Warriors. So sorry. My apologies, I'm speaking too fast, my throat's a bit dry. Anyway, for weeks now, they end up beating down the Road Warriors, Legion of Doom. Cost them, you know, they compete in the Tag Team Tournament uh, Finals against him and the, and the two members of the Nation of Domination. They throw, like, there were buckets, you know, pouring, uh, was it pig food or pig slop onto Hawk. So, lead up this match at the pay-per-view. 
Um, the Goblins are not really getting over, man. They're just not getting over. Yeah, they're, they're, hog, they're basically hog farmers. Because we're getting close to the Attitude Era. Yeah, they came out wearing the, um, the what was it, waving the Confederate flag, you know. You know, because this 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 um show was in the north part of America. They represent the southern states of America. Um, anyway, so the match was good. I mean, I thought it was going to be a clusterfuck between the Legion of Doom and um, the Garwins. But besides that, I think they put on a, a decent good match, you know. The storyline going into this, you know, you had the Garwins trying to break a hawk's neck. You know, one more of the match, uh, I think it was Henry or Villiers trying to hit um, a leg drop off the ring apron. A uh, hawk out of the way. Then they work on Animal for the whole time. You had uh, a cameo appearance of Captain Lou Urbano, who was attending the show far near the crowd. Um, anyway, so what about the match? You know, I think it was Phileas or Henry. Grab Hawk by his back. He hold his... Basically trying to choke him out with this um, hangman, deadpan hang choke hold. That was kind of like... Mm, uh, usual, unusual. But um, anyway, so, you know, basically just... Like you, you guys, because they're tall, that grabbing him by his back, one heart, they choked him out with one one arm behind his back. Um. Anyway, so they were going for like the doomsday device, but they like stopped it. They stopped it. I think like one of them pull, like push a hawk and animal off the top rope. In the end, um, you know, hawk and animal got the victory. Um, you know, they hit a, I think it hit a, a spike power drive onto Henry. And before that, you know, they hit, um, they basically had, uh, I think it was Hawk hit, um, Henry with a twisted neck breaker. That was, you know, because mm -hmm. he just came back from neck injury and probably made the neck worse. So anyway, so the match was good. Like I said, the guard ones are not really getting over. They end up introducing Uncle Cletus, but at this moment in time, if they did this gimmick, yeah, the I thought they changed their characters, you know, because they're getting near the attitude era. The you can tell that the new generation era is nearly at an end, you know. They end up they end up becoming the um Southern Justice, um, you know, teaming up with Jeff Jarrett, you know. That was in the attitude era, the following year in nineteen ninety eight, and then Henry end up you know, they end up using their real names and then Henry left the company and then, you know, Dennis Knight become Midian, be part of the Undertaker's Ministry of Darkness and the rest of the history, so so moving on to the next match. So the next match, this is for the European Championship. Um, the British Bulldog, Davy Boy Smith, defending the belt against um, the world's most dangerous man, Ken Shamrock. Um, if um, Bulldog lose the European title, he must w uh, eat dog food, a can of dog food. So on paper, sounds a good. It could be a good match, but in reality, the execution sucked. It was okay. It wasn't a terrible match. It was okay. But yeah, it it was disappointed. Both styles do not uh, mix. You know, I think Cam, Cam was more for the technical style, the, the cage fighter. Bulldog is more of the strength technical style worker. There can, but you know, there can. There is no chemistry. You know, um, the two matches. Wow, for Ken Shamrock in his first um, early uh, months of his run in the company, his match with Vader was okay. But, um, he got buried in 1998, but, um, wow, he's just like, oh, Jesus Christ, he, he's trying to get to adapt to the WWE, or really the professional wrestling style, because he came from the UFC, MMA, you know, he's one of the pioneers to support the UFC on the map, you know, back then, you know, it's, back then is in the mainstream, popular, back then, it was trying to, like, it was like a baby, um, the UFC, but, um, you know, basically Shamrock is one of the pioneers, put that company on the map, put MMA on, on the map, so, yeah, he's trying to adapt to the professional wrestling sp slash sports entertainment style, you know, he's trying to adapt, but, um, anyway, so, it was okay, in the end, a uh, bulldog throw, I think it was a dog of, was it, a, a can of dog food in the face of, um, Shamrock, can, uh, basically, um, snapped, I think he choked out a uh, British Bulldog with the sleeper. And then you got like suits and ties and referee trying to break, trying to stop uh, Shamrock. And Shamrock ended up like suplexing, um, yeah, suplexing the referees. Probably, uh, I think you had uh, Pat Patterson and and pro probably Gerald Briscoe, <laughs> the uh, f the future Vince McMahon's uh, studious 
in the corporation the following year. So, and also the one kicker about this, they show a you know like they show like this like image of the next not the next pay per view the pay per view after that um a bulldog defending the European title against Shawn Michaels at one night only in Birmingham in the United Kingdom. That just giving away that it proves that uh, Ken is not gonna win this uh, title on this show. He's not winning. You know why could have Ken Shamrock won this match? You know one night feeling, and then the next night on Raw, um, Bulldog dropping the basically win the title back. You know, and then and moving on to facing Shawn Michaels at one night only. So it'd be really cool to see a funny moment seeing Bulldog one segment eating a can of dog food. I don't think it hurt him. But it can be funny. It reminds me of um, when uh, Simon Dean, you know, losing the match of Bobby Lashley and he's have to eat a hundred cheeseburgers. That was kind of funny. Um. Anyway, so moving on to the next match. So the next match, this is a eight man tag team match. This is basically the worst match of the night for me. We got eight men. We got four members of Los Puyquas, Um. Sadio Vega. We got Miguel Perez, we got Jose Estrada, and Jesus Costello. They're taking on four members of DOA, the Disciple of Populets, Crush, um, Chains. Chains is the former Undertaker, the former Undertaker, the fake Undertaker in the Undertaker versus Undertaker match at SummerSlam 1994. Um, and was it uh, Ch uh, was it Skull and Eight Ball? They're the former Beverly Brothers. The future Patrick and Gerald, uh, you know, they end up like they yeah you know, the future creative control. You know, they end up like teaming up with Vince Russo, who's an Oscar character. The powers will be in WCW, and also the future House Twins. Um, yeah, they were you know yeah Savio and Ch um, and Crush. You know, you know they were former members of the Nation of Domination, but Farouk kicked them out of the group. And Savio and Chain, uh, sorry Crush, my apologies end up um, forming their own group. Savio Vega formed Los Bariquas, or Los, Bari Los Bariquas, how, how you pronounce it. Um, and Crush forms the Disciple of Populates, you know. They're basically a motorcycle uh, gang. Bef this is years before Team A end up doing Aces and Eights. I don't know which one's best, which one's worse. Uh, Aces and Eights or DOA. Um, anyway, so before they end up feuding with the, the Nation of Domination, they were kind of like on the same page, but plans change, you know, Ahmed Johnson suffered a knee injury, then, you know, then, you know, the Bowie Cross turned heel, DOA turned babyface, this is the Faction Warfare gang, Warfare, that inspires what AEW is doing right now, anyway, so, match was a clusterfuck, I, I tried, it was boring, it was a chore to watch, um, you had the members of the Nation of Domination co coming do down to the crowd. You had uh, the leader Farouk, D'Lo Brown, Karma, the future Godfather, and Armin Johnson, who just came back from knee injury. You know, he suffered a knee injury. This was like two weeks after you turned heel, turned on The Undertaker, in that brawl between uh, the Nation and DOA. Um, anyway, so they came from the crowd. I think it was Chains. Um, Trying to cheap shot Armour Johnson and Armour Johnson hits our uh, chains. I think it was chains or crush. Hits one of the members of DOA with the pure river plunge. And then I think it was one of the members of Los Bowie Quas. I think it pins one of the members of DOA for the win. And that was it. So that was pointless. And um, yeah, th this whole wa faction warfare, it was stupid. You know, it's like um, Vince Russo was running this. Um, it was part of, was head of you know head writer at the time. I prefer AEW's faction thing better than what they are doing in 1997. So you know both Buikwas and DOA they did not really go over. The DOA got disbanded. The both Buikwas I think Buikwas was disbanded later on in the year, and DOA stick around until you know they got disbanded in 1998. So they never stick around. You know, in the the beginning parts of the Attitude Era. So, so moving on to yeah, this is um technically the second best match of the night, but this was a game changer for both guys. So we got Owen Hart to represent the Hart Foundation, defending the Intercontinental Championship against Stone Cold Steve Austin. So at Canadian Stampede, um Owen pins Austin in that ten man tag team match. 
um, in set up this match on the show. So Austin said that if he fails to kick Owen's ass, beat Owen for the Intercontinental Championship at SummerSlam, um, he will kiss his ass. So Austin, basically before the start of this match, he's trying to get in, like he's in backstage, you got a pay-per-view appearance, the first pay-per-view debut for Michael Cole, trying to interview Austin. Austin kind of pushed him away uh, from a from a side. I think he shouts, says, "Your goatee doesn't impress me. Um, you piece of trash." Yeah, four years later, he ended up being the fuck out of Mount Cole when he was the heel in two thousand one. So Austin was a heel. Actually, he was a tweener, but he was leaning more heel. He was, you know, you, you could tell like Austin. He could technically he was a baby face, but you can say tweener because. It got it will more lean. I think it will lean more babyfish ish in the in nineteen ninety eight. So anyway, so um, the fans got really react to Austin. You could tell like you know that Austin's gonna be the man. He's gonna be the face of the company. You know he's gonna be the biggest star of the of the, of the company going you know going into the nineties and beyond. You know not just the popular star in the in professional wrestling. Um, you know he's. Going to be, what I'm trying to say, he's going to be the, he's going to be the best, um, he's going to be the most popular wrestler, not just in the Attitude Era or 1990s wrestling, but in professional wrestling overall, because of his gimmick, you know, with his, with the bald head and the goatee, when he, he wears like little earrings, you don't see it, um, and, um, with the, with the fast, doing the middle finger, drinking beer, you know, he can, he's relate to the people, you know. You know, he's in your face, so, you know, Austin got with that good reaction, um, this was the last time Austin wrestled with the, um, with the, te you know, seeing the technical style version of Steve Austin, you know, he was, you know, like, he's, do he's been doing this technical style wrestling, you know, before the neck injury, going back to the days when he was, he debuted with the company as the ringmaster, and going back to stunning Steve Austin in WCW, so, the match I really enjoy, really fucking, in, I really enjoyed this match. Back and forth between Owen and Austin. Um, I think one more of the match you had Owen trying to break Austin's hand, trying to break the middle part of Austin's finger when he's doing the middle finger, trying to break the middle finger of Austin's hand. You know the joint manipulation uh spot. Um, they were fighting in the crowd, fighting the entrance bit of the um of the arena. Um, yeah, it was really compelling, you know, they both, like, lock each other with, um, sleeper holds. I think Austin counted it with a stunner. Not a stone cold stunner, but a regular, stu a regular stunner. And I think he hit Owen with the stun gun, his original finisher in WCW. I don't know if it was the last time he's, uh, done that move. Yeah, I don't think he's done enough, did that move ever since. I'm not too sure. So, anyway, so let's talk about the spot. This is the reason why this show is memorable for... Like this match, um, Austin and Owen. So, so basically, um, um, Owen. So basically, you know, Owen. I think there was an Irish whip. Austin was going to hit Owen with the tilt to wheel backbreaker, but Owen counted it, hit the tombstone power driver onto Austin, spiked him on his head. You know, it's not the. It's basically his. It's an ultimate for ultimate version of not ultimate alternative version. I'm trying to say. Of the Undertaker's Tombstone Power Driver, Undertaker does the Tombstone Power Driver with his with his um knees. Owen did it ass first, and Austin was for the last few minutes in this match was basically he was paralyzed. It's said in his book that he's gonna end up like Christopher Reeves. You know, Christopher Reeves is the guy who plays Superman in the in the seventies and eighties. Go and look it up. Um, he said to him uh, in that book, you know, I'm paralyzed, you know, and he said to uh, he tell Owen I'm paralyzed, you know. Owen was stalling a little bit, says Canada chance. He said Austin will kiss my ass. Um, Austin started to crawl and rolled up Owen with a worse rolled up to win this match and win the Intercontinental Championship. On paper, um, on paper, you thought this would be Austin's like triumph moment. You know, this is his first singles title win in his WWF's run you know he debuted in the company in the early parts of 1996 you know unfortunately it was overshadowed over, overshadowed with the arm um, of this arm um, of this spot what owen did the put the, the power driver 
It's just like it really, it really buried Owen. You know, you thought that you know if Austin was proper paralyzed, holy shit! You know how many? Uh, that's a lot of money wasted for the day like F. You know how many like money they're gonna make out of Austin? How many WrestleManias Austin's gonna like missed out if he's proper paralyzed? You know, look at. Uh, what's his name? The one guy is proper paralyzed in professional wrestling is, what's his name? Uh, Darren Drozov, you know, Droz, you know, he had a match with, um, with D'Lo Brown, D'Lo hit his move, it, was it a sit-down power, what's it called, a high sky? It's basically a sit-down power bomb. he injured his neck, and he's fucking paralyzed, you know. Owen suffered politically, really, it was a karma for Austin, because, I never knew this, because Austin did the same spot, um... Towards Masamino, was it Masamino Chono? It was in Japan, probably in Ch Japan or WCW years earliest, and injured Chono's neck. Um, um, here's a story. Uh, Austin and Owen, they kind of planned the spot, and he said to like he said to Owen, you know, do this, th do the power dro drop me on, dro drop me on my head. Sorry, stumbling by the way. He told oh, tell Owen to drop me on my head, you know, with the power driver. You know, the Undertaker's Tombstone power driver. Are you going knees first? And Owen says, no, nah, uh, no, ass first. You know, but I think he said, uh, I said, I watched Austin's shoot interview about this match. You know, more preparation for more information, to, like my preparation to review this show. So he was kind of ripping on Austin. So, and also, like, he did the same spot with, uh, uh, with uh, with Brett, you know, because you know they, like, you know they fought years earliest in nineteen ninety four. You know, Owen hit the power drive on to Brett, and work it worked flawless. It has to do with the uh, heights and side difference because Brett it was Owen was five ten two twenty, Brett was about six foot about two thirty. In this match, um, Austin's taller than Owen. Uh, like I said, Owen's five ten two hundred and twenty seven pounds. Technically, nearly two thirty. Nearly two thirty. Austin six two two fifty. Maybe it has to do. He can't control the weight of Austin. That's the reason why, you know, he didn't really. The move was botched. You know, if it was, if Austin was a bit shorter or maybe a less wet, if he was a, li a little bit lighter, maybe it might it might work perfectly. It was supposed to be a false finish. You know, yeah. Austin said he's plans to have him beating Owen for the title on the show, but um, yeah, I glad Austin recovered and you know, become the company's megastar and the most popular star, not just in 1990s wrestling, but in overall professional wrestling history. So, Owen never recovered, man. You know, both both Austin and Owen never speak to each other before Owen passed away in 1999. Austin's career finished, you know, seven years later. You know, he ended, you know, his injury, you know, he had a neck problems over the next couple of years. Had neck surgery in 1999, and then in 2003, he retired in the ring. His final match against The Rock at WrestleMania 19 in 2003. So, yeah, it's a damn shame. And also, here's a little kick about the Intercontinental title picture. So, the title was held up. Held up for two months. You know, Owen went on to win the Intercontinental title back in the Intercontinental title tournament at Bad Blood. Then they had the rematch between Owen and Austin at Survivor Series that year. Austin defeat. Owen in the rematch, and it's a bit pointless. What well, Arrow have like the match ending a, a no count out to protect them. So and also they end up made it made this into a storyline. You know had uh, Owen wearing a t shirt that says Owen three sixteen I just broke your neck. You had this segment with um, police officers. You had Austin getting arrested. Austin Stone Cold Stunner Vince McMahon, and um, yeah um, the rest is history. So yeah the match was it was good. Before they did the spot, but I don't. I'm not gonna say this match was bad. It was bad for the spot, but before the spot, I think it was still the second best match of the night. Moving on to the main event, we got the Undertaker defending his World Wrestling Federation Championship against Bret the Hitman Hart with the Heartbreak Kid Shawn Michaels as the special guest referee. So after Canadian Stampede, Bret was named the number one contender to face the Undertaker. For the WWF Championship at SummerSlam. He said that if he fails to win the title at SummerSlam for the fifth time. He will never wrestle on American Souls ever again. Um, the build up to this. Undertaker was a non-fact to this. It's more between Brett and Sean. Because on the Raw when they did a show in Nova Scotia in Canada. 
um, Sean was named the special guest referee for the Taker Brett match, and yeah, the tagline is Heart and Soul. Um, you know, Brett represents the hearts, and Taker represents the souls. Um, anyway, so yeah, Sean was the, the special guest referee for the main event of this show. Anyway, so uh, yeah, the lead up to this, you had Brett got into this fight between um, him and Vince McMahon, you know, knocking his headphones, and both got in a tussle. You could tell the plants were seeded. I know Vince become Mr. McMahon after Survivor Series 97, after the Montreal screw job. You could tell the plans were seeded in this segment between Brett and Vince. Everyone knows that Vince is the owner of the company. It's not like it was like it was a hidden secret. Um everyone knows he was he is the owner of the WDF, ran out the WDE, you know, before Triple X taking over in our current timeline, but um but he is the uh, he was an announcer, a commentator, you know, because you can tell Vince is getting away from becoming a commentator and becoming an authority figure. Seeing this with um, Brett and Vince having that brawl, and weeks later, you know, having Austin stun Vince, you can tell, like, Vince is going to be, you know, Vince McMahon, the authority figure, you know, Mr. McMahon end up kissing asses, you know, for, you know, this, this, you can tell he could be this top heel for the next 20 odd years until, you know, left the company, stepped down this year in 2022, so... Yeah, on the Go Home Show, Brett <laughs> lost to the Patriots, um, that's Dale Wilkes. He ended up, like, coming out with, um, the future of Kurt Angle's theme music, you know. Um, yeah, you know, the Brett and Sean rivalry, everyone knows, they're not just feuding in, in, on screen, but they were public, you know, they're feuding in real life after the events of, um, you know, after, like, Sean refused to drop the title to Brett at the, you know, at WrestleMania 13, after Sean defeat Brett. At WrestleMania 12 in 1996, the previous year, did the whole lost your smile, fit the knee injury, or had the knee injury. They possibly had that match at um, King of the Ring, but um, you know Brett had the injury, and also they had a real like fight. Um, because Sean did the whole, you know, Brett had some, you know, the sunny day remarks. You know, he thought Brett was cheating on his wife with to uh, Tommy Sitch. Anyway, so Undertaker was not really a non-factor this because he was in the middle in this rivalry between him and Paul Bearer, the whole storyline with Kane. Kane won't debut until October of, of that year, so. Anyway, so the match was really, this is match of the night between Brett and Undertaker because they both got really good chemistry. Um, but knockable pace, um, yeah, the, some bulks of the match, you had Brett working on the leg of the Undertaker, like, like slamming his leg on the ring pose, locked in with the figure four leg lock, locking the hold on in the ring, um, really like stopping Undertaker, you know, he's like tall, stopping like, stopping doing like the, the, the old school, I think he did the old school on Brett, um, I like, you know, the story between Brett and Sean, you know, like, you know, yeah, Sean getting in the face of Brett, you know, you know, when Brett like locking the hold on the Undertaker on the ring pose, and also, t Brett did like the sharpshooter onto the Undertaker on the ring post. That was cool to see. He also did the, the move in the ring as well. He got some, you know, cameo appearances. You could say interference. You know, I don't know how I call it interference. Yeah, Paul Bearer come, come around. Undertaker decks him. You know, I don't understand why Paul Bearer was there. You know, but you had, uh, you know, you had Owen and, um, and Pillman was there. Bulldog was still suffering the effects of the sleep hold attack by Ken Shamrock. You know, Taker fed him against. Uh, fed him. He fed himself against Owen and Pillman. You know, Brett's fellow members of the Heart Foundation. Don't understand where's Nineheart. Um. Anyway, so. Anyway, so and also Sean. And also he got in the. You know, basically Taker got pissed off by Sean because Brett hit. Um. He's like. Taker hit Brett with a choke slam. Shawn Michaels was still outside the ring. Taker was about to pin Brett. Um, I think Shawn was trying to make sure both Owen and Pillman was stayed away. Proper away was gone away. But um, you know, you had um, yeah, you had this competition between Taker and Shawn. 
Um, and also, sure, and also, Brett did less. He did a middle finger towards the American fans. Did a move off the top rope, you know, and then did give them did in the middle. It give the American people a middle finger. That's the, because Austin was doing that, you know, first. Then Brett was doing it, you know. You can tell that the company is going to get more edgy because, like I said, um, seeing Brett, you know, did the, the blowing the lines. Why is real? Why is fake? And um, you know, real faking kayfabe. You know, real kayfabe. Um, you could tell like um. Because at the time, Raw was still getting the asses kicked by Nitro in the Reigns War. You need to be edgy, but um, anyway, so I really enjoyed this match. Sean brought a lot of spice. Like he got, he confronted Brett one side of the match. You know, he said like, you know, you know, my patience really in film. Get your ass in the um the ring, or you be gone, Brett. Um, uh, I really enjoyed this match. Really fucking enjoyed. It. Back and forth. Really enjoyed. It. You know, it wasn't boring. You know, but I, it was a little bit. But I really enjoyed it. It's compelling. In the end, you know, first off, you had uh, t you know, you had Brett hit Taker in the head with a chair. Whacked him with a chair with a blue chair. It was blue back then, and before they end up coming black. Uh, Taker kicked out of the chair shot attempt by Brett Hart. Um, and then. Here comes the, the this a special iconic moment. I think it's one of the best SummerSlam moments. You know, yeah, the you know foliage diving off the cage in this moment. Um, I think you know, like um, uh, Taker like Brett was do, hitting Taker in the corner of the chat in the corner of the ring. I think all oh, oh, I think like Sean snapped the snapped the uh, took the chair away from Brett. You know, and Brett basically spit in the face of Shawn Michaels. Shawn trying to hit, uh, trying to whack Brett in the face with the chair. Brett got out of the way, and Shawn accidentally hit the Undertaker in the head with the chair. He had this camera camera shot where Shawn says "shit" and did the free count. And Bret Hart beats the Undertaker and become the World Wrestling Federation champion for the fifth time. I think it's the second guy hold the most title belts. Because the first one was Hulk Hogan in the well, 80s and early 90s, and then Brett did it in the, you could say mid 90s. Yeah, the most. The, by the way, the most got the guy who won the title most is John Cena, in the uh, in the 20 in the 2000s, you know, mid 2000s, and gone into the mid 2010s. But um, and that was a bit of a trivia. So yeah, um, this has led up to Sean turning and heel, forming the Duration X with Triple H in China and Ravishing Rick Rude. Um, yeah, Sean turned and heel, man. You know, I, I compare him to AJ Styles, man. He just wants to see Brett. And by the way, and also, I forgot to mention this, you know, if Sean didn't call the uh, corner in the middle in this match, he also would not wrestle in the United States of America ever again. He'd end up moving to Canada, but... Um, you can tell the um the stipulation is bullshit. So you know that Brett is going to win the title anyway. Struck him with the iron was hot. So you can tell. I think Undertaker, his run as the world champion, you can tell was a cool enough point. You know, you know. I think at this moment in time he doesn't really need the title, but it was a disappointment. But yeah, Brett winning the title. Going back to the Owen Austin thing, I think this was karma. You know. This is karma going like with Canadian Stampede and SummerSlam. You can tell that this was the rise and the fall of the hearts. You know, you had, you know, like you had like this celebration after being the Americans. You know, at the Canadian Stampede, celebrating with the Hart family. To this, you know, having Owen breaking the neck of Austin and Bret winning the title. You can tell that this is bad luck's going to happen. You know. You know, late, you know, later in the year, you had the Montreal Screwjob, Brett leaving um, the WWF in an anticlimactic way, and then you got Owen's death in 1999. So, yeah, it's, wow, this show is a calm. This show was a karma for the heart, so. But, um, yeah, the end of, you know, Brett and Taker had the rematch at one night only. I'll get to that next month, but, um, yeah, I really enjoyed this match. It's a damn shame they never did, like, a triple threat match for the title. Brett, Taker, Sean. It had this, uh, I think on paper, it really ha probably had this um, Triple A, Shawn Michaels, Chris Benoit vibe, you know. Could really one be, could be one of the best Triple Threat matches of all time. I think for me, the best Triple Threat match of all time has to be um, Shawn, yeah, Triple A, Shawn Michaels, Chris Benoit, WrestleMania 20. You know, that was good, but um, I don't understand why they never go into that Triple Threat direction. 
don't know, maybe Brett was, I'm not too sure, I think maybe Brett was totally against the whole, whole idea to do like a, a multi-man title match in the main event. You know, I don't know, I, I understand Rock really, I know Rock totally against the whole idea to doing like a multi-man uh, title match in the main event, you know. See how that, well, the fatal four-way match of WrestleMania 16 was disappointed, but um, on paper it would be really good because... Like, cause three men end up feuding for the rest of 1997, so, you know, and also Undertaker and Sean went on to feuding, you know, in the autumn, going into the autumn of 1997. They fought at Brand Zero, and they fought in that iconic first Hell in the Cell match, and then it also introduced the debut of Kane. Brett ended up feuding with the Patriots, you know, going into the autumn of 1997. Yeah, they had the rematch at One Night Only. And then having that match with Sean, first time, first time since WrestleMania 12, leading it, and then they had the module school job and the rest of history. So, anyway, so uh, my final rating for SummerSlam 1997, Heart and Soul. Overall, I give it a seven out of ten. People give it an eight out of ten. Eight out of ten for the show. It's their opinion, but I don't see it as a great show. To me, I think it was decent. It was a decent SummerSlam. Going into this, I thought it was going to be a bad show, mediocre. It was a little bit mediocre, but it was a fun SummerSlam to watch, you know. The only match in the bad for me has to be the, the, the eight-man tag team match, you know. Los Pariquas versus DOA. The, cost, the, the million dollar contest was a waste of time. You know, doing segments on pay-per-views just simply do not work. Save it on weekly TV, man. I said in my like, previous pay-per-view reviews, you know, it just never worked. The undercard was mediocre. It was okay, but not like must-see matches, you know, like, um, Pillman and Goldus was okay, um, Bulldog and Ken Shamrock for the European title was okay, um, uh, yeah, um, but, uh, yeah, it was okay. Uh, there were okay matches, um, uh, the good is the good, and also I'll put the um the power driver spot in the Austin Owen match. That was in the bad as well. It it changed. It was a game changer for both men. It changed the careers of both men. You know, Owen was in the dark house. Well, basically, well, it was buried politically. He ended up becoming the blue blazer two years later before his death. Um. Anyway, so um the good is the good. Actually, I'm trying to say um the tag team match between the Legion of Doom versus um the Garmoys was good. Um. The opener was really good between uh, Mankind and Helmsley. Um, the mo instead of the part, yeah, like the most of the Owen and Austin match for the Intercontinental Title, that was good. Before Owen did the botch power driver, you know, Tombstone power driver, and breaking Austin's neck in the process, but that was also good as well. And the match of the night for me has to be um, Bret Hart versus The Undertaker. Man, really, you know, it was a good SummerSlam. I would call it a great SummerSlam. It was like seven out, seven out of ten is fair. You know, I'm not saying it's a shit show. It wasn't a must see show, but I give it a slight thumbs up. So, anyway, so hope you enjoyed my review of SummerSlam 1997. Leave your thoughts in the comments section below. Smash the like button. Click the like. Click the, click the bell. Subscribe to the Central Man Network on YouTube. Be part, be, be part of the Central Unit. Sorry, I'm stumbling. Be part of the Central Unit for more wrestling videos and more. And next time. You know, I'll get what I'm, I'm, I'm gonna review one more SummerSlam, you know, to end the SummerSlam season. I know we're not we we don't have SummerSlam for this year, but I know we had it last month, but we didn't have it for the month of August. So I know, yeah, this was the 25th anniversary of SummerSlam. Next time to to close out the SummerSlam season for the month of August of 2022. Next, this month marks another anniversary of a SummerSlam. We had the return. We had the return of a showstopper, and also we got the coronation of the next big thing. You know what I'm talking about. I'm gonna talk. I'm gonna review SummerSlam 02. This is the Sentiment officially signed out, and that's my review of SummerSlam 1997, Heart and Soul. Like I said, I give it a slightly thumbs up. It was a.